All right, so like Dave said, my name is Greg McHale, um, engineering director here responsible for storage and performance engineering. So I'm going to take you guys through a high level view of the architecture in terms of what we needed to do from a platform standpoint to kind of enable all this, this cool feature capability in a way that fits within the economics of conventional enterprise storage. And I'll give you a deep dive into the I.O. stack and what it is that we do to enable all the, the criteria that allow us to do the advanced data analytics on the on the information that's coming into the product. And then I will hand it over to Dr. Eric McCall, who will take you through <laughs> how, the, uh, how the storage analytics, uh, data analytics pieces work. So from a starting standpoint, um, you know, within, within the existing enterprise storage products, everyone's accustomed to storage platforms have two controllers, whether it's active-active or active-passive. And Paula had alluded to you know, various types of just kind of uh, evolutionary technology. You can increase the speed, you can, you can change how much space is actually consumed by virtue of playing games with um, you know, allowing that other controller to service I.O. You can play games around how much space your, your snapshots and your backups consume in the form of, of compression and dedupe. And, you, know, you can have a 100 terabyte raw storage array and by the time you set up your, your data protection policies with snapshots and how much you want to reserve, you're really probably looking at you know, 50 terabytes of usable and, and this is a pretty standard thing. And you can add JBOD shelves and expansion and so forth to increase that capacity footprint. But you're, all pl you're playing games around the dimensions of IOPS capacity and capacity efficiency and you're doing that within the standard price point we all kind of know and love, the 50, 50 to $100,000 for, for that kind of capacity point. So to start off and think about how to build up uh, a, a platform that would allow you to do some of this data awareness stuff, you almost have to think about it as an equation with those parameters I talked about. Your, your, what your controllers are doing from a compute and memory resource standpoint and how much money you're allocating to those, your snapshot and your data protection policy perspective, and then also, you know, number of spindles, types of spindles, whether it be, you know, flash and hard drive and, and what it is that you do with those. So when you, you start to tease some of those parameters out, what, what Paula and John had come up with was that basically within the, within the confines of existing resources, you have some compute and memory resources that are available to you that basically are doing nothing but receiving data from the other controller or trying to serve additional IOPS within an existing footprint. And, you know, depending on the active active implementation, you might not quite get two X, which you had when you only had you know one controller doing things. The other piece is is from a snapshot you know protection policy standpoint. Yes, you can compress those. Yes, you can dedupe those. But from a fault isolation perspective, they live on the same exact spindles in a conventional storage array. So you take some of those pieces, you tease out the spindle piece, you move those over as an isolated you know fault isolated storage pool. You give those a dedicated controller from a uh, compute memory resource standpoint, now you have very high performance access to the data that's on those spindles. That data is backup data in the form of snapshots. So now that you have all these resources associated with that data, what are the things you can do? And what are the things that you can do that basically have no impact whatsoever to what's happening from a, from a primary I.O. standpoint? So, so that's how, how from a, um, you know, an economic standpoint, you tease apart what the pieces of the equation are that lets you fit within the price point that data gravity does, within the hardware requirements that people are accustomed to, but then also allow you to increase not just the IOPS and the capacity and the capacity efficiency, but bring a whole bunch of, of new features to the table. So with that, I will reveal our <laughs> architecture diagram. So Dave teed it up with this, this the ABCs of storage slide. <laughs> So there's, there's a little bit of a joke here. Um, I have a, I have a four-month baby at home who allegedly is watching the, uh, the live stream. And my hope is he's the only one who's either sleeping, drooling, or crying <laughs> during the presentation. <laughs> but if the drooling was for good reasons, we'd allow it. So, so my life has revolved around you know, block letters and twinkle, twinkle, little star and the itsy bitsy spider. So we decided to do an architecture diagram in the form of, of, of lovely little block letters. So <laughs> as Dave talked about, we support variety of protocols, SIFs, NFS, iSCSI. We support virtual machines in the form of ESX data stores. Today those come in over NFS. Depending on what the protocol is, 
you know, there's, there's a variability in the richness of the metadata that comes with that. SIFS and NFS, when you're the server, provides you a pile of information. You know the users, you know the files, you know the, the operations, you know the times, you know exactly, exactly what was going on with those files. iSCSI in the block world, VM being VMDKs living on top of NFS, it's, it's still, we're still able to discern what changed with respect to, to that because, as Dave talked about, we break into the VMDKs and we can figure that information out, and Eric will go into that in more detail. And we also have the Data Gravity Intelligence Service you can install either on your running virtual machines or either on your iSCSI clients that will allow us to get that additional information that basically lets us make each protocol uh, similarly rich in terms of what we can extract from them. Question? Yes, the SIFS and NFS, can you do that on the same share? Can you present it on both protocols? No, so a, a, a single share only gets one representation out. Okay. Yep. And so, so we, pull the, we pull the metadata information out of those protocols uh, in something we call our DGFS layer. So DGFS is, is a mixture of a couple of things. At the, at the top layer of that, it's something that understands how to extract that metadata from the, the packets as they came into the product and convert that into something we call activities. So activities are then synchronized over to the other controller in real time as they come in. That's why Dave was showing as you know, someone was reading a file, someone was changing a file, someone deleted a file, someone created a new file. Every single one of those activities as it comes in, in real time, is logged and, and pushed over to the other controller. In parallel to that, the data has to be mirrored to the other controller anyway for data protection purposes. So it's got to go to the other controller, get, you know, get put into non-volatile memory and acknowledge there so that you know that that data is persistent. We use that existing HA stream so that when the data goes to the other controller, we simply push that down to the file system stack that's running on that other controller, on that intelligence controller. So now you have your backup copy, which you already paid the price of pushing the data anyway, whether or not you were, you know, in a conventional storage array, you're pushing that data no matter what. So we take that copy, we push it down in the file system, and that starts to create some of the preconditions for being able to do this, this data analysis and this, this data analytics. Uh, the other piece is that, that layer at the top of DGFS, because it understands activities, it understands the files to which those activities pertained, and it understands the data that goes with those, is the thing that enables us to do that instantaneous fine grain backup and restore that Dave demonstrated. So on a per file, per user, you know, per content oriented basis, you can go in and figure out what changed and, and, and what you'd like to restore. Underneath that thin layer, so we decided with, with all the, the novel and, and interesting things that we're doing in this product, writing a, a basic file system from scratch was not something that was particularly in our best interest. So we went and we used somebody else's. In our case, we're using ZFS. And we chose ZFS for a couple different reasons. One of them is it's been around a long time. It's very robust, it's very reliable, it's very stable. The other reasons are uh, it has a, a very clean transaction engine that makes it simple you know, to optimize different performance aspects of, of what you're trying to do within your file system. And out of the box, it comes with inline compression and it comes with inline dedupe. So that put us in a position to, to really you know, move ahead in the, in the file system feature space without having to invest the years and years that it takes to go ahead and build a, a file system of a, of a similar level of robustness. Now, in order to optimize performance access within that file system, we had to do a couple different things. One of them is we took the file system metadata and we separated that out onto, onto SSDs. So we have six SSDs that are in the system, three, are, you know, three for each controller. So the metadata is triple mirrored in the, in the product for fault redundance purposes. And then we also have an SSD cache that's striped across those three SSDs. So we get a nice aggregate capacity uh, across the three of them. That cache device is available up at the file system level, so literally right below the protocols coming into the product so that we have data cached and available for the users really as high in the stack as we possibly can. On the intelligence controller, where we also run the DG file system and, and down as our I.O. stack, we have three SSDs over there as well. Also used for metadata separation, the cache device over there obviously isn't needed for user read access because users aren't over there reading data. So we took that cache device and special purposed it for the intelligence processing services that uh, Eric's gonna be talking about in a little bit. 
uh, underneath ZFS, we basically had to had to write our own virtualization uh, disk layer. That's what, what VDL stands for. The reason being is we talked earlier about the economics of primary storage disks and snapshot reserve. In our case, it's primary storage disk and, and intelligence storage disks. Uh, out, of, out of a 24 drive enclosure, out of the gate you start with eight on the primary, eight on the intelligence pool, and then eight in the, in the free pool. And so we wanted the ability to sort of dynamically grow and shrink how many disks you could use between each of the storage pools, because it kind of has a similar <coughs> variability uh, like snapshot policies do. There's certain shares that you might want to keep a 200% reserve on, and certain shares you know you might want to keep a 10% reserve on. You add to that the di the dimension of you know the value of intelligence as it pertains to certain shares and how much intelligence information you want to keep that's associated with those. And you're starting to play the game at a higher level. It's it's how many disks, how much aggregate storage do you want associated with your primary side and with your intelligence side. So in order to be able to accommodate that grow and shrink piece, we had to write a, a, a virtualization disk layer underneath ZFS so that we could teach it how it could change the size of the storage underneath it, in particular teach it how to shrink that storage for cases where, where it might make sense to do that. Uh, we also wrote our own, uh, our own RAID implementation. A lot of people ask why, because RAID feels like a, a fairly commoditized thing these days. Well, in order, to, in order to be able to grow and shrink that storage in a dynamic way, without degrading the RAID set required sort of a, a new perspective on, on what the definition of a RAID set is. So in, in a conventional array, if you want to remove one disk from a RAID set, you're going to take a, you're going to take a, uh, um, a data a, uh, integrity risk in doing that because you're basically going to de degrade the access of the storage pool for that period of time. So what we opted to do instead is implement a RAID layer that uses many, many small virtualized RAID sets so that new data coming in immediately gets assigned uh, a geometry that's the one that you intend to be using in your ultimate state, whether you're growing, whether you're shrinking, actually whether you're rebuilding, it all kind of works out the same way. And, and only legacy data allocated on those small virtualized RAID sets uh, needs to be migrated to the new geometry. So there is actually no data at risk from a, you know, I'm missing one drive and I'm degraded. There's no such thing as being degraded while your geometries are in transition. <clears throat> so that's the reason we, we had to go ahead and, uh, and do that. So, um, you know, Dave talked about uh, the concept of reinventing the snapshot and calling it uh, the discovery point. So at that DGFS layer, the activities are sent over and for a, for a given file system, those activities are put into uh, a gigantic list. We call them change list entries, activities lists, catalog. We kind of use those terms interchangeably. They're then uh, connected with the snapshot that was taken on that file system that contains all the data pertaining to the changes that incurred, occurred in that time frame. And that's what we call the discovery point. And then over on the intelligence controller, is where we reach into that discovery point and start to do some of the processing and the indexing and the analysis that yields the file activities pages and the search capabilities and characteristics uh, and those kind of things that you saw in Dave's demo. So I'll take any questions on the storage stack or I'll hand it over to the doctor to, to take you through the magical <laughs> side of the system. <laughs> questions? How do you upgrade or expand? Do you just add another box? And so uh, we, within, within the, the 24 drives, you can grow and shrink dynamically between based on the existing 24. If you want to add additional storage, uh, JBOD-based expansion is in the not too distant future. Thanks. Nice. What about SSD and stuff? If, if you wanted, uh, uh, can you expand the high performance stuff? In, in, in the current incarnation, um, the answer is, is no. And the, from the roadmap perspective, we have, so the, the, way, the way the platform is structured is we have a compute head and the JBOD that are in the 6U. Within that compute head, there's uh, excess slots that are available that could take two and a half inch SSD. We, we have plans around cache expansion. You know, for instance, if, if you had, had uh, you wanted to accommodate specifically uh, a substantial uh, VDI workload that you knew needed more cache than you got out of the box, you could see us being able to do pure cache expansion. Uh, you know, from the from the overall storage expansion standpoint, to see how metadata and data kind of have to scale together, and that's why we have we have the room to be able to do that. Cool. I have to ask this. Um, Is it a Twitter question? Well, 
Kind of. In theory. Sort of. Maybe. <laughs> um, Shy person. Maybe more specific about SMB. Is it 2.1, 3? 2.1. 2.1. Okay. And, and it's, 3 it's is... It's just that you keep using this word and it doesn't mean what I think you... <laughs> what you <laughs> meant. It, we actually do support SIF, so we do support... We're the only ones probably left on the planet who supports 2003, but I won't say that out loud. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's, it's SIFs and SMB, and the reason we put SIFs in is because... When we first got started, we said, okay, we can do one or the other. We can't do both. What's more important to you, 2003 or 3? And you know what? Over 100 people told us 2003. Yeah. Give us right? backwards compatibility first. Yes, get us backwards compatibility and then do. So we started that. joking around. At st I, I saw Steve hates it. We do support both. <laughs> we absolutely support both. Yeah. But we should really say SMB. But then we talked to our marketing guys, and they say, why do you have small and medium businesses in the box? And we're like, yeah. we're like, okay, I can't win. I'm going to call it yeah. Fred because the keys are close. Yeah. Right? But we that's kind of how. M's actually, that, It would have been SMB, but he didn't have another M. Oh, <laughs> the combinations yeah. of letters and colors make Baby it a big challenge. It. <laughs> and say as much with as little as possible. Can you run multiple protocols on the same array? You can run every single one of those in okay. parallel. On the same it's not like a, on the but not on the same oh, not, not on the same line. Line. Not not on the same, same, same box. On, on the same box, but not on the not same, same line. Array. Correct. Obviously, yeah. Can you explain what the the RAID part again? You're, you're using RAID six, but you're using a custom version of RAID six, so you don't have two parity disks. No, so we do have we do have two parity disks. From a data protection standpoint, you could think of it as conventional RAID six. So we can survive any two failures. We're using the the high performance Intel SSE libraries for for GF multiplication and you know generating XOR data and so forth. So all of that is is the conventional level of data protection. The thing that's different is rather than doing it as one monolithic gigantic RAID LUN, it's many many, many small virtualized RAID LUNs that gives us that ability to be fluid and dynamically convert sizes. Basically, you got double parity, but it's not We do have double parity. But, yes. but it's like the, going way back, the EVA, you'd have groups of disks that made up a, a smaller, but we're going much more granular here so that you don't have this collection of disks makes up a RAID set. You have this segment of this segment and this segment of, of a set of disks was a RAID set and then different segments. Everybody could grow. Has anybody ever had to go back and shrink a RAID, uh, RAID set? You know, had to create a whole other one, evacuate all that data to reclaim those disks? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they don't have that problem with us. So this was another gee, I don't know moment. Um, so we went and asked customers how much intelligence data versus how, many primary, how much primary data do you need? And so we asked for ratios. And I thought that would be a simple question, but then I realized I didn't know for myself either. So we decided that you wanted an intelligent array to be able to expand and contract based on the data. And so we said, why would you ever contract? And they said, well, maybe we've, we've got too many backups. We're going to go delete some of those, or we're going to go move them off. So we want to be able to repurpose the disks. Um, and we're like, that's kind of cool. And I understand where you don't know. So it was a lot of things happen when you ask customers questions, and they say, if you make me pick, make sure you can get me out of it. And so we're like, well, maybe we won't make you pick. Because you probably don't know. And it's fair to not know, because it depends on what your change rates are, and they change. So. Doing what you've always done. I own that URL, years. by the way. Serial was testing to carry going forward. I mean, at some point, you have to be innovative. Uh, Hopefully, we, we are on innovative way here. <laughs> 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 All right, Doctor, you're up. Awesome, thank you. All right. I said if they keep calling me Doctor, then I should get a time machine too. A Tardis. Or <laughs> haven't got one yet. So. Um, I'll write. I don't have block letters on the other side or anything like that. I'll try to write neatly, but not that neatly, probably. Um, so Greg kind of covered, you know, when we have this this uh, enterprise class array, you need to be able to f tolerate a controller failure. What that kind of means is you have this other controller on the other side that you're replicating data to, but it's kind of sitting there. You've provisioned it to have a nice read cache. You've provisioned it to be able to take the primary I/O load, um, but most of the time you don't have to do that. So the, one of the clever things that I really like about this, you know, what we've built here, is that we're using the other controller. Um, speak up, all right. We're using the other controller uh, to actually do some work and do a lot of work um, and provide all these features that Dave uh, showed in the demo. So I'll just go over, um, you know, feel free to interrupt or ask more questions along the way. Um, and I'll just kind of talk through how we do that. Um, so, what do we have here? We have a, a, an HA stream, activity data. We also have uh, data coming. Um, I think Greg 
you know, he talked about having a, uh, a, a change list, right? So we have this kind of collection of changes coming in from the other side that described who did what where. So all these different protocols, um, well, not the VM and ISCSI so much, but, but these two protocols have user information. So if, um, you know, Steve uh, saves an image, we know that he saved an image to the array. That comes in as changeless data. The actual blocks of the file come in as well, and those are replicated down to the disk layers on the other, other side. Um, so on the other array, we have a you know, DGFS underneath it all, and a whole bunch of disks. And um, on this side, the, the data get written down to the array, and the changeless get written over. When we take a discovery point, um, that's the point in time that a lot of the processing of the activities uh, happens. So the activity data being you know, who wrote what when. So this stuff is structured data. Um, that is stored in a database that drives further processing and drives actually a lot of the stuff that we showed, a lot of the analytic data that we showed um, in the other side. So I'll kind of talk about some of the software components we have on this side, and then we can go into more detail about what they do, and I'll, I'll just cover that. Um, we have a rule engine, um, some other pieces, management layers and so forth, that tell when we're processing a discovery point, what do we want to do with that discovery point? What do we want to do with the files? You know, we're, uh, Dave showed some of the policies that are controlling when backups are taken, how often they're taken, um, how long they're retained, but since we're doing this other processing, we also want to know what we should do to the data in there. Um, for a particular, you know, uh, when we recognize particular kinds of files, what kind of information do we want to extract and store? Um, so that's kind of controlled by the rule engine. Since we have that and we want to, you know, now what this gives you is uh, the ability to show a catalog. So if we take a discovery point and interpret that like it's a backup, that now we can tell you what files were in that because from the activity list, um, we know what files were created on the array and then in between any two discover points, uh, what files were processed, what files were touched, and what operations the users did. So we can show that information. Um, so we'll take a step further though and say, well now let's find something out about these files. So when we're processing a discover point, we can look back, query the files that are stored on the restore side in the snapshot and find out like how big were they? Who owns them? What's the mod time of the file? What's the access time? And we can take that information and store that back in the database. So now we've augmented the analytic information that we're storing. Um, that's gotten a lot richer. But why stop there? We can have uh, content extraction. So there's a content processing piece that, again, is fed by the rule engine. So we can go in and actually crack the content of the file and pull out the, the information that's inside. Um, we can do things, you know, Dave showed some of this stuff where we're looking for credit card numbers or social security card numbers. And if we find that, we can again update the structured data that we have in the database with uh, what we call tags um, and then show that in the user interface. So if we find data that looks like PII data, social security card numbers, credit card numbers, dates, um, you know, sort of the sky's the limit. You can imagine like any kind of regular expression. Uh, if we find that in the data, we can tag the file with that so we can quickly tell you which of those files had that in the actual content. Um, but there, you know, people have been doing research, lots of smart people have built database technology and content extraction technology and search engines. Well, people are accustomed to that, so, you know, we can put a search engine in here too, right? So we have a search layer and the rule engine can then say, okay, based on some of this stuff, we can determine, well, gee, this is a file, it's a, it's a PowerPoint document, it's a PDF document. People generally care about the content of, that's in those files. So let's extract that content and index it and then make that available for search. Okay. How often are your discovery points taken? That's again governed by the policy. Um, you know, by default comes out of the box, we'll take them every four hours. Or again, if the change rate happens, we'll take them more often. Um, we'll, you know, every 15 minutes or so, it'll check for change rates. So um, it's, it's certainly feasible that if your rule engine flags a, a file for like um, PII data, by the time you go in to fix it, it's already been fixed. Like somebody knew that and yeah, it's certainly between feasible. there, you, you look at the file and you're like, there's no PII data in here. Yep, okay. absolutely, yeah, that's, okay. that's totally. How far do you go to discover the type of file that you're looking at? 
I mean, do you look at the 21st uh, Magic Headers, 24 uh, first bytes or? Yeah, it's about the 4K uh, in the file. Because a lot of people who want to hide their MP3s, they know this trick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they put some binary blurb at, 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 mm -hmm. at the start of the file. Yep, and they, so that's possible. But once you know the trick, you can build in technology to go and look at that, right? So we don't, you know, a lot of other products, if you look at them, they look at the extension of the file, so, so and which is, you know, that's not terribly useful. Um, so we actually do go in and we look at the header of the file. And based on the data that are there, we'll determine what processing to do. We don't go further than that now. Um, you know, you could imagine this. So, so one thing is we start talking about this, we'll, we'll, you know, often what happens, we get into, well, we could do this and this and this and this. So what I've described here is sort of, it's a, it's a foundation, right? This is where we're starting. And we have some great features that we showed with that. Um, and, you know, what gets everyone excited, we, we, it's too easy to go off and say, oh, we could do this and this and this. And really the challenge of uh, the company and building next versions of the product is to figure out what to do. Uh, so what not to build and wh where not to go is almost as important as figuring out what we do want to do. Because a lot of this stuff, you know, if you, um, we talk about the, the change list. Once we recognize, well, various classes of users, if we look back at the Active Directory, we can find out what groups they're in. And so if this group of users is using this amount of data, we could feed that information back to the primary array and put that, you know, in, a, in, a, in, in cache to better serve those kinds of users. There's so much that we can do here. Uh, makes it very exciting, but that was a long-winded answer to your, your question. Uh, but in reality, yeah, there's there's certain, you know, we'll, we'll run into stuff like this, and based on customer need, we'll adjust the product. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. This is not something that you're going to make public to the customer or available to define your own rules how to discover file types. So this. Um, this rule engine is built, it's not exposed to the customer right now. It was built as a, um, a way of rapidly refining the product. Um, you know, it, it is, it's a configurable engine, though, with configurable rules. And uh, you'll see some of that power be exposed to the customer in appropriate ways. This, of course, by adjusting this sort of thing, you can have, like, if we, you know, said, okay, you can inject any filter you want into your storage array. You can imagine IT administrators not being so comfortable with that necessarily, right? Because this could have performance implications too. So we have to be careful about, mm -hmm. you know, how to expose the features of the products. But yeah, you could imagine that sort of thing. Or uh, working with third parties to develop plugins or, you know, this kind of stuff. Okay. Um, but this rule engine shouldn't have any performance impact on the data being written to the array because they're on separate controllers, right? Yeah, they're, so the disks are in separate pools. This is all running on the, on the HA controller, if you will, on the backup controller, right? And so some of the things about the architecture that are interesting is you have, you know, the SSD cache here. You're serving reads here. You don't serve reads here. Right. Well, you do actually because these components are reading. And so you're using that hardware that you've paid for to enable this kind of stuff. Right. The memory is sitting over there and so forth. And so then, yeah, if you have, you know, you, you get uh, consequences like if you have a controller failure and now you have to fail over, well, you've got to shut down a bunch of this processing, right? It makes sense. You're running in a degraded mode. You know, you have to give some of those resources back, right? And then when service is restored, you go back to the normal uh, processing. Okay. Um, so I can go into some more depth about, you know, what we're looking at, what we do with the content extraction. The other thing Dave is showing is, um, you know, being able to preview files and types, right? When you, um, there's a, a user interface layer here and that's going right through to this side uh, and um, interacting with the software components here that are identifying the content of the files. Um, and then when they're extracted here, we're showing to the user what the intelligence side has actually seen. And there's, you know, a whole bunch of the other features that we have. Once we have these indexes, uh, another interesting thing is that these are changing over time. So unlike some search appliances, you know, if you just have a, a storage array and you take a backup and then you index the content of the backup, that's also just getting sort of a snapshot in time of what we're tracking here. But in here on this side, we have all of the snapshots and all of the activities going through time, right? So we can show stuff like the trending view. Um, that you don't get from sort of instantaneously updated uh, uh, snapshots, you know, point in time uh, search indexes. Um, and that also would enable, you know, uh, stuff like discovering what typical user behavior patterns are like, 
Um, it can enable a lot more discovery about how your users are using the system. So this stuff goes really beyond just the content and the analytics about the content, but also into analytics about what the users are doing with that content. Um, that's one of the key uh, uh, insights of the, the product. So what we basically built is a data platform. We have all of the standard storage metrics, plus we've added people content and time, right? So you can do any correlation or data transformation based on people, content, time, and activities. So you can imagine all kinds of transformations. Like for example, you could imagine us telling you if this Word file has the same text as this PDF. We can start to surface those kinds of things, right? You, so you can, you can imagine us being able to do a rich set of features. Um, we also do scanning for regular expression. So you can define certain patterns in the data. So if you wanna know, for example, you know, if you're supposed to be tracking no clear case credit cards or social security numbers or no email addresses someplace, we'll start to surface those and, and do those formats. So, but what you're seeing here, um, controller one, controller two, or the, you know, everybody else is either active passive or active active, and when they're active active, they're undersized, undersized, right? Where we're active, intelligent, oversized a little bit. Um, and we're basically creating a metadata layer that includes people, content, time, with correlations with storage activities so that we can show different stories about the data. So you can imagine with a storage, when I did a different storage company, the number of features you could come up with is you could do auto Smart manager just so many times. We've got such a rich way that we can do these data transformations that that's what gets Eric excited and scared um, because there's almost anything we could do and our customers are helping us drive what we should do. Um, and it's really in the areas of helping people secure their data and get value from their data. Right, so you can see, you know, one of the things that we provide is uh, risk assessment. You know, the governance aspect is interesting. You know, having the, the change list information tracked over time lets people go back and ask questions, you know, both for storage reasons about how they're using it, but then also um, answering questions that, uh, you know, when we want to know if there was some PII data or personal uh, information that was made available, who has read it? So what are my, you know, it, it enables you to use your storage array to find out what your exposure was uh, to those sorts of problems. Um, Does it show you who's read it through the storage array interface? So for instance, an administrator is logged into the, into the array and was like, oh, this is personally identifiable information, and they open it up, and they're like, yeah, it is. Does it show that they opened it? Absolutely. So there is a, that information is audited. Uh, there's a, you know, it's not actually tracked as part of the changes okay. when you do that. So there is an audit log for that kind of information, okay. right, for um, can administrator activity. The array alert the person who last wrote the data to say, hey, you've got information in here, but then not allow the, the administrator to see that data? Um, to just like flag it and say, this, was, this got flagged for PII, and it sends it back to whoever wrote it and says, you should fix this. So, so there's, the, this is, gets into a, like a content alerting uh, kind of a thing, and you yeah. could. So there's a couple. Like I said, it's a, it's a good reason we're doing Tech Field Day again at VMworld. <laughs> okay. But um, there's a concept of a super user, and they can see everything, and we encourage people not to have them do that. Basic storage administrators can't look at data they don't have access to, um, so they can see that somebody has an issue but they can't go read it. So for example, you can't have your IT guy getting everybody's credit card numbers, um, but you can have your super user, um, and which might be, you know, might be your CIO or somebody. You may not want anybody else to be able to go in and see things, but someone has to be able to go in and remediate. So we do have the access layers with the security and the security checking as to who can see what. Yeah, so for some of these features like the, the preview, the download, some of the links that Dave was showing, the restore, we'll actually, actually um, you know, if, if it's a file on an SMB share, we'll go back and check with AD to see if the logged in user has permission to read that file or write. If they don't have permission to read it, it's not going to be shown to them in the UI either. Okay. Since you have this metadata about all the content there, would it be feasible to, to add something like data classification on top of that as, as a tech in there? Absolutely. Are, you, are yeah. you providing that? Well, we're providing some classification already based on the, the type of the documents that are found. Because then I right. could avoid that this Active Directory master administrator sees data that he shouldn't be seeing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So permissions of AD is not sufficient to protect everything, I think. Yeah, so what 
what you're getting into a little bit there is, is uh, uh, if you find data that you don't want to show to other people, are there actions like a quarantine action or something like that? Um, and so there again, you know, that's on. That's certainly doable mm -hmm. in here. That requires a slight difference, which is allowing the the intelligence side to go in and affect what's on primary, mm -hmm. right? Which is, you know, uh, depending on the storage people you talk to, they have mixed feelings about allowing, you know, modifying data on the primary, um, right? These are sort of like two worlds colliding here a little bit. So the quarantine action and, and the remediation uh, is in the governance and data security space, whereas in the storage space, you wouldn't want to necessarily do that. So I think w one thing I didn't touch on was uh, the, Dave touched a little bit on is, is the SIFs and NFS activities coming in here. Um, we promised to talk about the virtual machines. And since this is virtualization field day, I should probably do that um, a little more. So the VM images are stored on the array and by without any agent software installed, you know, without the uh, the intelligence service installed, we can go in and find out what files were touched. But again, because read information is not stored. Uh, just on the disk, um, we don't have that. So if the service is installed, then when snapshots are taken of the virtual machine, um, when they're processed over here, we can go in and collect the, the full activity information so that the features of the product that you get on the, in the uh, SMB and, and NFS cases are the same features that you'll get in the, in the uh, virtual machine case as well. Um, and that's something that's, you know, Pretty exciting. Um, so I can go into a little bit more detail about the the change lists and how you know files are tracked. Um, there's a you know there's a, there's a lot of problems that we had to solve along the way to get a consistent view of the catalog, just based on activity information. Um, uh, or answer more questions? Or I've, uh, I've talked to several people about this uh, right after you guys were at VMworld and one of the, the main concerns, it was cool that you were able to crack open a VM and do the data analytics on that, but one of the major concerns I kept hearing from people over and over again was, what, are you going to corrupt the data that's in the VM that can't be read later on? And nope. that came up more than one time. Yeah. Just so. Think of it as a backup of the virtual machine, right? Uh, I'll draw the analog to like uh, Veeam or Commvault. They're going to use APIs. They're going to quest that virtual machine. They're going to take and make a copy of it. They have to actually extract that data and put it into their archive format. When we have that virtual machine, we're taking a backup of it. We don't have to extract it out of the storage system. We're taking and writing it into an archive on a fault isolated set of disks. So we are doing that analytics on a backup that was already quiesced and acquired through the APIs from VMware. We just didn't have to do change by tracking and a lot of the overhead. We had to carry a VMware snapshot to get the quiescence and then we released that. So um, we're probably the most minimal impact virtualization backup just for the fact that we're, we already have it on the same class of disk inside the box. But it's not doing it on the running machine. It's, running, it's doing it on a backup copy of the machine. It just happens to be in the same storage platform. Okay. Keep in mind, because we are a storage array, we know exactly what changed, so we don't have to play any games with change black tracking, archive bits, storing anything in the VM or in a iSCSI LUN. We have the list of what's changed as it came over, so we don't have to go do any of that. So for your VMs and your iSCSI LUNs, we're interrogating them, we're not writing to them. When we, when we store them, we go back through the host operating system to restore them. Because if we were to ever, storage vendors are not allowed to write to metadata formats they don't own. It's like one of the, if there were 10 commandments, that's like <laughs> commandment one is storage vendors are not allowed to write to formats they don't own, right? So we read the iSCSI format or the NTFS format or we see the VMware format and we, we, can, we can interpret it and extract information, but we never write to it unless we go through the host who owns it, right? right? Yeah. And anybody who does write to your format, you should run away, run away really quickly. Yeah. Great question, though. Thank you. Yep. So, okay. Okay. Any questions on the architecture? Obviously, that's uh, you know that, that's going really deep. It's something we weren't able to do when we launched the company at at uh, Tech Field Day or Virtualization Field Day at the VMworld Extra Edition. In only an hour, it's kind of hard to get through that and go that deep. But you know, 
looks like a storage array from any other vendor fundamentally operates totally different under the covers, right? Uh, and obviously there's a lot of new IP, a lot of innovation here that um, you know, just doesn't exist in the world. You know, some of that obviously is patented already by us too, so yeah. Another good question came in. Yeah. It was, um, can you make compliance conditions or rules based off of an existing preset like PCI, SOX, HIPAA? Yeah. Um, so we don't, uh, we don't have like a compliance report. However, we surface the information that you need to be able to look for to answer those questions, right? Um, no, no, one, no one tool does it soup to nuts. You always have to, you, know, you have the network layer involved, you got database layer and all that kind of stuff. But for what we have at rest, we help identify those questions. And I would, I would challenge to say that we even help identify um, some areas of data that people typically don't look at in the PCI world, right? You know, you, you have your in-scope network, you focus heavily on watching that network, but you have an end user who enters that network, takes data out to help the customer, and then saves a copy of it to their home directory, right? They just actually put your entire home filer in scope, they just didn't know it, with data gravity to do that, right? So we help remediate that, we can surface that up. Um, and if, you're, if, you, you know, if you like what you're hearing so far, if you tune in at, at, at VMworld, you'll see a whole expansion on that story of data gravity where we'll help you even continue that, uh, that compliance journey and give you that awareness around your data. And you're able to do analytics on databases as well as just files? Not today. So, um, you know, databases, there are a lot of tools that do databases, you know, so, um, well, yes, we probably will grow at some point into some forms of structured data. The unstructured data is the mountain of data that lives out there that people call dark data. It's the hardest data to ask questions of because there is no structure. So you got to have people like Eric to build a system to get it back into a structured format so you can start asking questions of it. So we really started at that, that human-generated content problem, right? Because humans, uh, you know, they have a computing node that does things randomly, right? So we, we help put some structure back around that. But uh, great question, and we, it does come up all the time. That said, there's nothing to stop you from taking the data that you can now infer from data gravity, taking your favorite database analog tool as well, bringing those data sets together to answer your questions, right? I mean, I, I, yeah. So which means, uh, for, um, for example, Exchange Server, you, you cannot index... Uh, the Not today. On the data bus, yeah. Not today. Um, natural question. Obviously, Exchange, SharePoint, those are natural repositories, a lot of unstructured, rich communication and, and data that, you know, it, it's obviously something that's all focused on our roadmap, but nothing I can talk about today. Yeah. Can you automate any of these searches sure. or have them flying alerts or alert certain individuals <laughs> depending on certain patterns or... You guys all want me to get to that special session that we're going to cut the video feed for, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. Me. Yeah, again, again, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Natural question and answers tune in a VM world. <laughs> so my, my question about APIs is probably in that same category then or uh, part, yeah. Uh, because you answered that you can make that information surface for this compliance report. Well, a, a lot of that, you know, so we're collecting all this both structured and unstructured mm -hmm. data. You know, when, when you take the time to do that, you want to be able to uh, make that available to, to other tools and make mm. that available to the outside world. So today we have, there's an export feature. Okay. So any of the queries, any of the, the things that you run in the UI, you can take those results and export them as CSV, put them into Excel and do whatever you want, or some other tool and do what you want with them. This is exactly um, right. And we have customers that are doing that today. Just the fact that we can take that activity list or that list of files, you know, if, if you've got anybody in who has, has auditors who breathe down their neck in this room, you know the data demands that you get, get dumped on you say, can you, can you tell me what user X did when? The amount of data that gets produced for that, I've seen from our customer base, it's, it's, it's 40 hours of man work and a mountain of data. When literally the auditor themselves can log in and self-service that request with data gravity, it's a fundamental shift. You know, I, I think I saw a tweet here earlier saying, you know, I don't know how you know, why a CIO doesn't get the value prop of data gravity. They do get the value prop of data gravity. You know, even uh, the auditor, the CFO, anybody who's got those compliance requirements living on their head, they completely get it, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's just the natural, that's, that's one of the natural value adds. That's why I said in the very beginning, we deliver dollar per answer, right? It's not a cost you pay for, it's the value we return, and we're returning that information. So just to kind of heighten your imagination, this was V1. 
Yeah, yeah. Imagine V2, V3, V4, and then I'll just do a little bit of PR. You can all boo at the end, but you know, you join us and stay on our service and you get all those features. Um, and we started the no array left behind a long time ago and we'll continue that, yeah. right? I was actually yeah, yeah. smiling when I saw one of my children boxes that were released in May of 2003 still running, yeah. right? So, and I expect to see some of our children boxes here Right, so I have grandchildren now. Um, uh, yeah, be running too. So you'll 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 get to see a lot of the features. But we built the architecture and the infrastructure, which is what both Greg and Eric talked about, to be able to do some pretty interesting data transformations. And now it's about priority and focus, scope, and um, input from you know our customers who are going to drive our roadmap. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our user base is is, is you know they're absolutely. Enamored with the product, um, you know, we're, we we listen to that feedback. You know, I, I actually had a customer ask me, "Can I can I get a copy of your configurator so I can figure out what I need to buy?" There is no configurator. <laughs> There's two SKUs. You choose your size. You choose your warranty. That's it. You know, anybody who has to have a configurator buy storage today, you know, go look at another vendor. Um, you know, you know, you know, it's just uh, it should be simple. There's no knobs in our product. You guys saw the user interface. There's not a single knob to a twist. It's PO to IO in 15 minutes. Intelligence five minutes later. I don't know how much simpler I can make it for you. Great. Any questions here before we uh, we uh, we wrap up with our live audience? And sorry, hi Chris. Um, <laughs> uh, before we we break into our special session here. I think Chris should mail you something. Oh, I'm sure he is. <laughs> I would have someone else open the box. I'm glad I don't live in them. Illinois anymore. Chris, 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 I put a little bit of distance between me and Chris. <laughs> He's actually in Austin now. Yeah, yeah. see? Yeah. I, I still put distance between me and Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. great. Do you want to do any wrap-up with the live audience, uh, sure. uh, Steve? Ready for that? Okay. Yeah, I think so. All of us. Or any last questions from Twitter before we uh, dump? Uh, sitting out there? Yeah, I'm I just out. had one come in. Um, for your audit auditing and discovery tools, are they uh, are they just good for internal searches, or are they also you know good for like legal compliance um, or like a litigation hold type? Yeah, so we, we play the first beginning part of the e-discovery reference model quite well. We help identify data, we surface the information, we build the list that you would want to take and take off to a product to do legal hold against. We don't do legal hold today inside the product. It's a natural request. You know, Eric kind of alluded to quarantine. Down the line, we should be able to flow into that. But the heaviest part of e-discovery is surfacing the information. You know, did Paula ever read the documents from Intel that they said, you know, don't let the CEO ever read, right? I can say yes, that happened. No, it didn't. I've got that impenetrable Chinese firewall audit trail. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you can. The, the very interesting thing about having all people content in time, you can either bury them, so we can help <laughs> you find the entire list of might might be interesting, or you can be microscopic about who read chocolate between these two dates, right? In these kind of file types. So it does let you get that first level forensics at a very fine grain. If you want to limit. The discovery. If you want to help them have a full set, you can find everything that's suspect. That's great. And I've seen e-discovery go both ways when I've been on both sides. So I shouldn't have said that, but it's kind yeah. of true. Law, legal, legal is one of our one of our. Um, I always say our vertical is compliance because it cuts across every vertical. But legal is a very uh, interesting vertical to us. They've adopted the product quite fast. Um, you know, obviously, if you've seen any of our customer success stories, they're in the legal space. Um, you know, especially the. The, 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 the mid-tier law firms who could never afford a million dollar data discovery audit system, right? But they still need storage, they want this, they want the audit compliance, that kind of stuff. It's a natural fit in that vertical. State, local education, government, retail obviously. Um, you know, our customer base uh, has come to us um, across the spectrum. And the interesting thing about the product is it really is an engine, right? You put your data on it and you can drive that engine to drive your business. Um, the real value of the awareness we give you around your data, and that means something to everybody else, depending on what you do in your business.